You've asked for more Styro Pyro? Let's check it out. We're going to look at this one. Dangerous Tattoo Remover from eBay is a million watt laser. <laughs> for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. I recently picked up this Chinese-made laser tattoo removal device from eBay. Now, according to the specs, this thing should contain a really scary pulse laser system inside. In fact, if this thing can produce pulses of, say, oh, I don't know, like a million watts, I'll be pretty impressed. Pulse lasers are used in real medical applications, but those would be a little bit more precise than something like a tattoo removal thing you'd get off of eBay. You can use pulse lasers in soft tissue surgery, for instance. If not, I'll have to give it some much needed upgrades. So yeah, without further ado, let's fire this thing up. So a uh, spoiler alert, this thing packs some serious firepower. See all those little marks in the screen? This thing is so powerful that it blew a bunch of holes in my camera sensor without even taking a direct hit. Oh my! What I'm getting at is that this thing definitely isn't a toy. I went ahead and used uh, deionized water for the coolant fluid because it turns out that ultra pure water is actually a really, really good electrical insulator. Pretty cool, right? That is a common misconception out there. It's not the water, it's all the little bits and pieces of metal in there like calcium and potassium that conduct the electricity. That's also part of the things that conduct the electricity of the water that's inside your body. So yes, pure water does not conduct electricity. Now before I power up the laser, I need something to protect my eyeballs because from what I hear, permanent blindness is a bummer. <laughs> the hilarious thing is that the goggles that came with this unit are the complete opposite color of my own goggles that are rated for a YAG laser like this. Alright, I got the energy maxed out. Here we go. Oh my gosh, that is loud. All the popping. It's literally blowing craters in the metal. That is a lot of damage. Check Didn't out those think it would be that loud. plasma fireballs. Can't say I've ever had a tattoo removed with lasers. Right here I have a two and a half kilo chunk of tungsten. Let's see what happens when I hit it with the laser. Tungsten's pretty solid. In case you don't find bent. these little craters impressive, tungsten has a melting point of over 3,400 degrees Celsius, the highest melting point of all pure metals. Now I wouldn't even be surprised if the center of the fireball is hotter than the surface of the sun. Compared to a lot of stuff, the surface of the sun isn't really that hot, about 5,000 degrees Celsius. It's hot, but for a little concentrated pulse like that, fusion reactors are way hotter than that, lightning's way hotter than that. What happens if you get hit by the beam? Well, one way to find out, I guess. Oh wow, it kind of tickles. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, it hurts, but not nearly as bad as I was expecting. I mean, it's used to remove tattoos, so... Now, unfortunately, burning off a tattoo isn't always so simple. Uh, for one, my pale skin and dark ink makes selectively destroying the ink a lot easier. <laughs> but the thing is, lasers are racist. I mean, those... That's true. Um, darker skin <laughs> would absorb more of that light. So inside this tip is a crystal of potassium titanophosphate, or KTP for short. It splices two IR photons together to make one green photon via a process called second harmonic generation. Now the fact that you can just screw this onto the tip to make this it change the color insane. Because it's usually a lot harder to pull off not only your optical processes like this. The green light does a much better job at removing the red ink. But really this isn't much of a surprise since red and green are on opposite sides of the color wheel. <laughs> okay, yeah, so it works on wood, but how about skin? Ugh, one way to find out. Ow! No. Oh, holy heck, that hurt. <laughs> it turns out a lot of things absorb the green light better, and that includes my skin. Yeah. So sorry guys, but I'm gonna have to pass on lasering this one off. I guess it's permanent now. Well, how about cleaning some dirty coins? Oh wow, Just look melt at that. the rust off. What is new? The polka dots give it an added touch. This whole process with the different colors just shows you how much absorption and linear energy transfer matters when working with radiation because after all lasers is a form of radiation not ionizing but it is a form of radiation just like just like regular visible light and what it actually does to people or surfaces is a function of the radiation itself like for instance alpha particles huge amount of energy because it's a helium nucleus so it's got all this mass, but 
it won't penetrate much material. A thin amount of wood can stop most penetrations. Even your skin, it won't even stop it. Granted, you don't want to put an alpha source right on your skin because you can still get some dose without it actually penetrating the skin. So I still wouldn't recommend that compared to, say, gamma radiation, which will go straight through you, but it won't impart as much dose to the actual object, whether it be a person or, you know, a, a metal target, wooden target, what have you. One that's a little more dependent on what it interacts with is a neutron because neutrons are slowed down more by hydrogenous material such as concrete and that's one of the reasons why reactor containment buildings are made out of concrete is it acts as just another barrier another reason why water is used as a coolant because it'll slow down said neutrons it'll slow down them enough so they can cause fissions but not too much that it completely absorbs the neutron. So water in the reactor to make your fissions and concrete outside of the reactor to prevent any neutrons from escaping. This same phenomena is true with laser. Don't you hate it when your transformers get all rusty? Well, luckily with this laser, you can burn the rust right off. Oh, wow, that's amazing. I don't even need to use corrosive chemicals. Just an unimaginably dangerous laser. Aluminum foil. Here's your trade-off. Corrosion from chemicals or burning things with lasers. That is a real thing that is considered in any, any sort of pre-job briefing because you have to often have to trade off between a couple of dangers. This is a pretty silly example, but 100% valid. Reflects all but just a few percent of the light that hits it. So is it possible that we can shoot through it anyway? I guess so. So yeah, another example. Aluminum cannot be enough to stop beta particles. Another example. Aluminum can stop beta particles, but not this laser. Actually pretty crazy, because remember, that's just light that's shooting through the foil. High energy light. Now if we look at it in slow motion, you can see little pieces of burning aluminum flying off of the metal. <laughs> Gamma rays are nothing but light, just really high energy light that you can't see. Pretty neat. Oh yeah, see all those little spots in the picture? This is when I noticed them too. Ah, f heck. Turns out that even without a direct camera. hit, the laser still <laughs> managed to blast a bunch of holes in the camera sensor. And since there's no fixing that, I might as well keep lasering stuff until the entire sensor goes blind. Wow. This one was suggested to me by YouTube user Viduli. It's Look just a block that. of clear acrylic. Now even though it's nearly transparent, the laser can still burn its entire beam path into the plastic. Now it's funny because I tried using this effect to engrave stuff into the acrylic. I oh, just ended up cool. vaporizing the surface of my table. It's like laser ballistics blocks. gel. A balloon seems like a silly test compared to everything else. But check this out. Nice. Well that was surprisingly difficult. What gives? It turns out that the hot plasma formed on the surface ends up absorbing most of the laser pulse energy. And this actually protects the material behind it somewhat. This is why military laser weapons are almost never pulsed. Oh yeah, I can't forget about these goggles that were sent with a kit. Now surely the sellers care about our safety, right? Ha! Huh, look at that. Yeah, that's right. Your retinas would look like a slice of Swiss cheese if you try- Wow. That's uh... <laughs> Just shows you the effectiveness of certain PPE in certain situations and that certain that PPE can be useless in other situations. Those are the worst glasses ever. To these things, big oof to those who bought one of these kits and used the included goggles. Look what happens if I don't point it at anything. Oh yeah, the air ignites. Think about just how crazy that is. That's cool. Air, which is basically transparent, is exploding in the laser beam. If you want to light the that air on fire so with nothing cool. but light, you need some gigantic power densities. In fact, the threshold is something like 300 billion watts per square centimeter. Now that gives us a lower bound in power density, but what's that say about actual output power? I started by measuring the beam divergence and then calculated the waste radius using the laser's wavelength. And this gives a diameter of approximately 10 microns. Now equating a beam of this size to the minimum radiance required to ionize air gives a minimum laser output power of 150,000 watts. But the thing is, there's no way that this thing is operating even close to the perfect Gaussian beam. 
So if it's, say, 10 times worse with a 100 micron beam diameter, well, that gives an output power of 15 million watts. And now this seems crazy, and it's actually several times higher than the instantaneous electrical power draw of the entire town that I live in. But when you deal with things that happen very quickly, you can have extremely high power numbers. Like a nuclear power plant, typically on the order of about a billion watts or a gigawatt. In the National Ignition Facility, he was talking about joules per square centimeter. It's about two million for this. Now this is creating conditions hot enough to induce nuclear fusion. 192 of these lasers concentrated to that spot gives you over 500 trillion watts. Now, one thing to keep in mind is there's not many thousands of nuclear power plants powering something like this because we're talking with on the order of nanoseconds or less. So the way you get all this power is you divide by 10 to the minus ninth or smaller. That's why these numbers are so huge because it is not sustained for long. Whereas a nuclear power plant produces a billion watts over the course of 18 to 24 months. So if you look at the overall energy yielded, that is far, far higher. So you can have kind of ridiculously, not inflated, because it is accurate to say these lasers are that powerful, but they just don't sustain it for long. To give you a sense of scale, nuclear weapons in watts are on the order of 10 to the 24th. But again, that reaction is so fast, so you're just dividing by a really small number. 10 to the 24th watts is about 1% of the luminosity of the sun. And nukes are powerful, but not that powerful. Well, how about using it to build a laser-pumped laser? There's a lot of ways to pull off laser inception by using one laser to drive another. But today oh I'm feeling old school, and I also want to play with some chemicals. I just need to make some solutions of these dyes in ethanol. These dyes are extremely photoactive, so a little goes a long way here. I started by filling a cuvette with rhodamine B dye solution diluted to about 10% of the original. Now placing the cuvette directly in the beam path does give some colorful light, but I can't be sure that this is actual laser emission. By kicking the cuvette off at an angle, the green laser beam is refracted through the cuvette so that it doesn't line up directly with a potential dye laser beam. Now sure enough, this reveals that the liquid is actually operating as its own laser, as there's now an orange beam exiting at an angle to the original pump green beam. Now that is pretty cool. The idea of combining lasers to make something else a laser reminds me of the concept of neutron activation. So you can put like a strip of gold, for instance, I remember doing this in college in a test reactor, inside of a nuclear reactor and bombardment of the neutrons. And in that intense neutron field, gold 197, which is normal gold, can absorb a neutron and turn into gold-198, which is radioactive. Specifically, it's a beta emitter. It's cool to know that this, that this concept can apply to other types of radiation. Now, of interesting note is the presence of these side beams running 45 degrees to the main beams. Now, it turns out that the corners of this square cell act as strong enough retroreflectors to form laser cavities here, too, thus forming this beautiful but terrifying laser star of insta-blindness. <laughs> Cursed beam path. Sticking a mirror on one end causes the majority of the dye laser output to exit in the opposite direction giving some sort of controllability. Still though, I wasn't comfortable viewing the output in person as the peak power is still very high. Yeah. My goggles don't even block this color. Now this is a real bummer too because orange lasers are very hard to come by. So what exactly is inside this beast? There's a flash lamp here that pumps light into a crystal of neodymium doped yttrium aluminum garnet, or NDYAG for short. There's a special optic that's added to the cavity here which allows it to produce such absurd pulse powers. Now initially it absorbs the light coming from the crystal, which actually kills the laser output. But what this does is it allows the crystal to build up a bunch of energy while the flash lamp fires. But after the optic absorbs enough light, it suddenly becomes transparent, effectively exposing the highly energized crystal to the cavity mirrors. Now this causes all that energy to get dumped in an incredibly short amount of time. When this Q-switch laser fires, pulses have a duration of about 10 billionths of a second, which means that light only travels about 3 meters during this time. To put that in perspective, putting a laser pointer in the- I'm the earth being flat. <laughs> Oh, uh, the styropower was just awesome. Looking at the energy storage capacitor, I see that it's rated for 1400 volts at 100 microfarads. When I actually measure the live voltage through a voltage divider, I see that it only gets charged to a max of about 800 volts, or only about a third of the energy that it's rated for. As a side note, 
Using this measurement go. as a way to estimate peak power actually gives a similar result to the one I got earlier, but this time I get about 30 million watts. For funsies, I use this number to calculate the strength of the electromagnetic field at the beam waist, and as expected, it's insane. Look at that, an electric field of over a billion volts per meter. That's wow. hundreds of times stronger than what the accelerators produce in the Large Hadron Collider. Now granted, that's over a tiny distance, but still- Yeah, it's all, it's all about the range, whereas it's, it's kind of like the whole, uh, the same thing with, uh, we talked about watts earlier, that if you shorten the range and shorten the time, you can end up with some pretty, pretty crazy stuff. It's kind of like what Styropyro talked about in the amps and volts video, too, where he talked about that um, a little static cling can be high voltage and high current, but doesn't kill you because it just happens on such a short period of time. Like here, yeah, you can have your high volts per meter, but you're dividing by nanometers so <laughs> there you go whereas the large hadron collider is kilometers shows the potential of lasers and desktop particle accelerators all right so back to modding this thing i went ahead and added enough capacitors to triple the energy in the circuit <laughs> so without further we ado go. let's test this thing out all right here we go um that was bad uh-oh you break it it just heck break uh-oh yep it broke it turns out that some underpaid grad students in the 60s came up with these empirical equations that describe the lifetime of a flash lamp with its drive energy. In fact, so much there's for a dramatic rating. relationship here, to the power of eight and a half, actually. That means that tripling the drive energy for a given pulse length will actually destroy the lamp about 11,000 times faster than running in its original energy. So it's no wonder that the lamp exploded. As a side note, pretty much all of the laser science in this video can be found in this book from 1976. I learned a bunch from it when I first read it four years ago, and the info is still just as relevant today. That's kind of like my nuclear physics textbooks. It's all stuff done by the 70s. I know the technology is old, but still, it's... <laughs> I recognize that exact font choice in those, uh, in those books. <laughs> that was crazy. And another good example of different types of radiation. And I like how you can have fun with numbers and create like a whole bunch of watts or a whole bunch of volts per meter with just a little small handheld, fairly ordinary device because never had laser tattoo removal, but um, I see it advertised up the wazoo. So <laughs> it's, a, it's fairly ordinary compared to say a uh, nuclear fusion reactor or the Large Hadron Collider. I always love Styropyro's videos. He makes it really fun the way he just educates through example. And he's serious about safety, but in his own unique way. And speaking of which, those, those were probably the worst safety goggles ever because they, they don't protect you from what they're supposed to. <laughs> Though granted, I doubt they anticipated max power holding laser to it, but either way, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.